One way or another, we're getting a booming light show tonight. It'll either be fireworks or severe storms if they get here first. The early afternoon 4th of July plans, they were the safest today, while the watch continues for fire danger out west. And I regret to inform you that a longtime hazard in Colorado is back. Parking lot rocks. Some of them are really aggressive. Not unlike my sport coat on this Independence Day edition of Next. So, we wait. We wait for tonight's fireworks shows, or we wait for the severe storms that could derail everybody's outside plans. So far, so calm. There is a nasty little storm rolling into Loveland within the past hour, and Fort Collins temporarily evacuated its city park 4th of July events due to a storm, but everybody's back at it up there. Worse that Denver is getting right now is tiny little bits of shade. Meteorologist Chris Bianchi knows something about shade because you, my friend, are getting it on the email and on the social media from all the folks who expected, as you did, the storms to roll in a bit stronger a bit earlier today. Yeah, I, I got to tell my mom to lay off of Twitter, but uh, the caps lock is certainly in play right now. I'm just telling you here, folks, the storms, they are coming over the next hour or so. I do expect things to kind of fill on in. I know, I know it has been slow going. I know a lot of you adjusted your plans here on the 4th of July, just to give you a heads up, predicting the future sometimes can be challenging. But north of Denver, south of Denver, we've had storms. Fort Collins, Colorado Springs have all had storms. And taking a look at Fort Collins right now, we're seeing some of that action right now. And we mentioned that storm that's up into Loveland. That, to me, at this point, is going to be the preliminary little line that's going to move its way down into the Denver area over the next little while. Let me just show you this in a bit more detail in just a second. But notice all this lightning up here into northern Colorado. Denver, again, this weird little hole where north of town, south of town storms. But in Denver, this weird little... Uh, almost a bit of a hole right now, but then you look off towards the north and look at this pretty strong storm that is approaching downtown Loveland as well as down here through Bertha, seeing a pretty good storm. Johnstown, uh, even the north side of Longmont getting in on this action right now as well. This storm crossing I-25 and heading towards Greeley. So for our friends up there at the Greeley Stampede, obviously this is going to concern you here in the next hour or so. Again, Denver right now, you look off to the north, that is the front that's going to move its way out through and impact our weather later on. But right now, not a whole lot here in the metro area. Southeast Colorado has been very, very busy. Look at Highway 50, La Junta on east and the Lamar. It is stormy right now. But look at this. By the time it gets about 8, 9 o'clock tonight, it's pretty strong storms in the heart of the metro area. And by the way, Rapids playing their game right now out there in Commerce City or about to start, I believe, in the next hour or so. Uh, I do expect, unfortunately, still lots of impacts to those fireworks shows and for overall outdoor plans in the next little while. So, again, I know it's been calm so far, but those storms moving on in. I, sh I should say Chris Bianchi was so sure that the storms were going to be bad that he brought his dog into work today so that his dog Penny would not be alone in the bad storms. So, anyway, guy puts his dog where his mouth is, I suppose. When Chris told people they need to bring their 4th of July... I think the other concern that I have going into the 4th of July is just looking at the severe weather forecast and knowing that we might have some thunderstorms and people might be choosing to do things under the cover of maybe their garage or a patio. So again, goes without saying, you're not bringing your fireworks indoors, you're not doing them inside part of a garage, you're not doing them on patio, and you're not putting even spent fireworks close to your house because that's how horrible things happen, like what happened down at Parker where South Metro says some fireworks put in a plastic bin ignited a house fire that destroyed two homes. Our unusually wet and relatively mild weather may not be ideal for the fireworks, the barbecues, that kind of thing. Certainly has helped people save money on their water and electric bills lately. So Excel charges more for electricity on weekday afternoons and early evenings. Next viewer, North Glen, Gary, told us that he opted in for Excel's flat rate pricing 24 hours a day. And he got the next bill, looked to see if he made the right choice based on the numbers, and Gary saw that Excel stopped sharing certain information. We asked our Marshall Zellinger to find out why. Smart meters allow companies like Excel to charge for electricity based on the time of day that electricity was used. Look at this bill, for example. Mid-peak is 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. on weekdays. On-peak, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays. And off-peak, 7 p.m. to 1 p.m. on weekdays. Also all day on holidays, like today, and all day on weekends. Summer rates took effect in June. Mid-peak is just shy of 12 cents a kilowatt hour. 
on peak 17 cents and off peak a little more than six cents. You can also opt out and instead pay a flat rate 24 hours a day. The summer flat rate is a little more than eight cents a kilowatt hour. If you opt out, though, you stay opted out for one year. One of the first stories we did on Excel in January was based on a question from Aurora Excel customer Ann Collins Smith. I wanted to know what would be the best rate. How much does it cost if I stay on flat rate? Or how much does it cost if I use time of use billing? That brings us to Gary in North Glen, who emailed us and said he opted out to a flat rate. And when he got his next bill, it no longer showed him his usage based on time of day, but instead just a total amount of electricity used. Gary wrote us and said, it would be nice to be able to do a month by month comparison to determine if I did in fact make the right choice. I would think Excel would be able to provide this information if they wanted to, since it is Excel's smart meter. We took Gary's concern to Excel, and in a statement, an Excel spokeswoman started with, we're happy to provide our customers with the ability to track their electric energy use in near real time through their smart meter. But that's only if they stay on time of use. If they opt out, like Gary and North Glen, they also opt out of seeing a breakdown of how much they're using and when. Excel continued with, at this time, we don't have the capability either online or on our bill to display two different rates for one specific meter. Let's bring back an interactive calculator that we have on 9news.com. You can do a simple web search, 9news Excel flat rate, and you'll find the story with this calculator. If you're currently on time of use, your bill will still have these numbers. So let's go through a quick example. Let's say you use 30 kilowatt hours mid-peak, 60 on-peak and off-peak when most of your usage happens is 300. That total is 390. So now let's get this out of the way. And you can see it's negligible. With time of use, you're saving 15 cents in that scenario. But if I can get it back here, let's say you're an energy hog and off peak you're never using and on peak you're using it all. All the other numbers stay the same and your total here with time of use is outrageous. So you'd be better off perhaps in flat rate, but you want to take a year's worth of data, which is what Gary wanted to do. But then when he switched to flat rate, he can't do the math anymore. See, that's why we need you to do the math on TV first. Because the, the idea at the end of the day is obviously saving money. No, no, I thought so too. Let me pull up. These are like frequently asked questions on the Public Utilities uh, Commission website. No, the time of use rate is designed to collect the same amount of revenue as the rate it replaces. It's basically to encourage people to not be energy hogs when everybody wants energy, not to save us or Excel any money. And I think a longer story, just to let you know, a longer story would be if we all saved yeah. money, Excel was promised a certain amount by the PUC. So if we all saved money by acting differently, yeah. Excel would go back to the PUC and say, we didn't get all the money we were promised when we had this previous rate, so we need to make up for it somewhere in the future. There's some people who want to celebrate their Independence Day from XL Energy, I think, is what's, what's going on. All right, Marshall Zellinger, thank you again. Former East High Principal John Youngquist is joining the race for an at-large seat on Denver School Board. Youngquist served two stints as East High's principal, 2007 to 27, uh, 2012, again, 2017 to 2021. East High, as you know, has been at the center of the district-wide school safety debate following the shooting there in March that injured two administrators. And since then, Youngquist has publicly come out in support of the return of school resource officers. He's now one of three candidates running to fill the seat that will be vacated by current school board vice president Ayante Anderson. He's going to run for the state legislature. Youngquist joins former Tatter Cover CEO Kwame Spearman, who made a brief run for mayor, and a guy named Paul Ballinger, DPS parent and former private school security consultant. Denver City Council is considering a program that would provide one-time cash payments to people in need who were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but who do not qualify for federal benefits. If approved, the city would fund that program for a year using $3 million in leftover federal COVID relief funds. It would provide one-time payments of up to $1,500 for families in Denver who are quote unquote directly impacted by COVID, but who don't qualify for other assistance like federal benefits. The city's Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs said they would expect that program to serve about 2,000 households and impact as many as 4,200 children. The city would partner with a nonprofit called Impact Charitable to carry out the program. Impact Charitable started a statewide pilot program during the pandemic and gave out $37 million in cash assistance that way. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulfstream waters. Sun's out, fun's out. Early Independence Day plans were the safe ones today. Crispy Donkey will be back with a look at what evening plans might get rained and hailed out. And a viewer asked an age-old question. What is in a name and when 
is a peak high enough to get one. Nine News legend Stormy Rotman's real first name was Leon. Now another fine Nine News meteorologist has earned himself a lifelong nickname. If you missed this, our Chris Bianchi was reporting live on tornado damage recently when the closed captioning system identified Chris Bianchi as Crispy Donkey. So that is now his official name. I do not make the rules on this. That is just how closed captioning works. And, and Crispy, if you were thinking that this was going to blow over for you and nobody would remember that you have a new nickname, you should know we received our first Crispy Donkey fan art. So let's take a look at that. It's from Noah. It's amazing. It came in this morning. He captioned it for Denver's own meteorologist who forecasts with sizzling accuracy, Crispy Donkey. So, uh... Crisp, if I can call you that, uh, this <laughs> this now follows you for life. Yeah, I understand that. And uh, by the way, that is phenomenal art, as you mentioned there, Kyle. That is hilarious. And by the way, I've seen quite a few of those come in over the last 24 hours. It's been kind of wild, Kyle. It's been well, uh, you've, interesting. This has been a wild, long weekend for you. It's kind of weird because it's this four-day weekend. It's like some people are off all through the weekend. Some people were back at work Monday. Everybody's watching the weather, trying to figure things out. And we've just been in this like really funky pattern lately. We have been, and it continues today. And by the way, it's going to continue for much of the rest of the week. But kind of the broad view right now, we do have a severe thunderstorm warning that's just been issued for the northern fringes here of the metro area, including including Milliken, Platteville, as well as Johnstown. This is for Western Weld County. And by the way, Greeley Stampede tonight, the last night, Greeley Stampede, this is headed your way. So if you're joining us from Weld County, this is a strong storm with up to half dollar sized hail. That's enough to do damage to, uh, to, to windshields, things like that. We are going to be looking at some damage probably from that hail that's moving its way through Johnstown and again, heading off to the east along Highway 34. So again, Weld County, definitely want to be inside right now with these storms. I know the big question we keep getting is, are we going to get our storms here in the Denver metro area? Or I suppose in the more immediate Denver area because we've mostly been left alone today. Fort Collins had a storm, Colorado Springs had a storm, but in Denver so far it has been relatively calm, but these showers and storms continue to push the way off to the south. So that means over the next couple of hours, I anticipate that things will continue to fill on in from north to south here in the Denver area. I will say that along and north of I-70, that's where you have the greatest chance at seeing a storm this evening and one with the potential for large hail as well as flash flooding. Southeast Colorado, that's where things are busy right now with a lot of heavy rainfall along the Highway 50 corridor from La Junta on east into Kansas. That's where we're seeing some of that heavy rain and also some of that large hail continuing as we speak. But as I mentioned, uh, again, I know that things have not been busy so far here in downtown Denver and points uh, off to the north, but we're starting to see the signs that we'll see some action here over the next couple of hours. So between about 8 and 10, I think here in the Denver area, we could be looking at some of those strong storms. As I mentioned, Last night, it looks like we're getting multiple waves of storms through the rest of the evening. So you may, so far here in the Denver area, we've lucked out so far, but I anticipate that we are going to be looking at some of the strongest storms over the next little while. So severe thunderstorm watch until 11 o'clock tonight. Notice that potential for up to tennis ball sized hail and 80 mile an hour winds, isolated tornadoes. And again, that watch includes the entire Denver area. And then once we get past that, Kyle, we were just talking about that overall pattern that we've been locked into. I'll step out of the way so you can take a look at the seven day forecast. It stays stormy for tomorrow and Thursday, but the severe weather threat will be lower for tomorrow. And I think we may be looking at a higher severe weather threat again coming up for Thursday. All right. Thank you, Crispy. Hey, we're keeping an eye on a fire that started today in Grand County. It's burning about 10 miles northeast of Winter Park. The wireless emergency alert that went out warned people that that fire is above the Devil's Thumb trailhead. So right now it's about 50 acres. The Grand County Sheriff says no structures are in the immediate vicinity. They haven't evacuated anybody. They're looking into how it started, but they figure it was probably lightning. Today's storms are actually not real helpful for firefighters working to contain wildfires like the Spring Creek Fire near Parachute. That one has been burning since June 24th. It's covered 2,900 acres. They have 37% containment as of today, so that's a fire line around about a third of it. The fire is still burning away from other homes and structures. It's going away from Parachute, so no evacuations have been issued. Red flag warnings are also in place down in Archuleta County, where two smaller fires are burning. The more concerning one is the 477-acre Chris Mountain Fire west of Pagosa Springs. They don't have any containment on it, and crews are thinking it's going to grow today. Tonight's next question comes from a viewer named Michael, who wants to know why some mountains get names and others don't. He wondered, is there a height requirement?
There's not a height requirement, Michael. A peak doesn't have to say be a 14er in order to get an official name. You take Mount KIA MIA south of Salida. That is 11,000 feet and change, but it went through the renaming process in 2007 to honor American service members. And there are a lot of different ways that a geographical feature like a mountain can be named or can be renamed, but typically part of the process is going through the U.S. Board on Geographic Names. Anybody can submit a name proposal, but the board tends to lean towards names that either have a direct association to the location or have a groundswell of public support. That federal board also seeks input from state and local leaders as well as tribes. In fact, that's the reason why the renaming of Mount Evans in Clear Creek County is kind of stalled out. The Northern Cheyenne tribe is objecting to the proposal to rename that peak Mount Blue Sky. No storm sidetracking this celebration. Denver's biggest Independence Day parade went off without a hitch. That's next. Denver's biggest Independence Day parade feels like a small town celebration. Take it from somebody who grew up going to the latter and now goes to the former with my daughter each year, who loves a good parade, especially when just about anyone can be in it. It's the Park Hill Fourth of July parade. So what we're doing is we're getting ready to Fourth of July parade, the biggest Fourth of July parade in Denver, and you'll see all the all the people that are going to be with us. So it's going to be a really neat year. Everybody ready? Come on. Okay. So this is our um, piano bike, the piano on a bike. Because I can even play for you. Ready? Here we go. You ready? Though, are you? No, he is. He's steering. That's why you have to have two people on a bike. Ready? Okay. Slow down. All right, we're having to slow down here because Mike Johnson is busy meeting the crowd. Happy Fourth. Great to see y'all. Look at this, and they're all excited. Look at all these people. This is just the coolest parade of all. Happy Fourth of July. Johnny Brown, a.k.a. Sam Wilson, Captain America. <laughs> oh, it feels great, like, like I'm representing and being a superhero. and it's, it's a fun hobby I enjoy doing. Oh, yeah. oh, man, they love it. They're like, look, it's Captain America. They all ask for high fives and all. All right, do your Captain America right. stance, Maddox. Is that your favorite time of the year? Oh, yeah, especially on the 4th. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All I hear is they're just happy to be here and celebrate. In America. So this is this is good time for Denver. This land was made for you and me. All of us. This land was made for you and me. Yay! Us. <laughs> Love it. Your festive feedback for the fourth, forthwith. Next. This summer in Colorado, danger lurks around every corner. Especially the corners turning in and out of parking lots. Rocks! They're back, leaping out of nowhere, lodging themselves in undercarriages left and right. The rock revolt first reported on, on Next, years ago, remember that target rock claiming victims? It's never really ended, but it seems to start and stop suddenly, like a Dodge getting rammed on the way out of the Castle Rock Panera. From Fort Collins to Denver, your photos prove the rocks are back at it. This summer, they're especially aggressive. Colorado drivers. You have been warned. Feedback by text tonight. Kyle, we truly enjoy your show. However, if you have a stylist, please get a new one. If you don't have a stylist, please get one. Is this, is this about James in Fort Collins writes, your sport coat tonight is a chef's kiss of Americana. It's like a barbershop quartet selling ice cream cones. Jeff says, jury's still out on whether tonight's is better than last night's. It is the inverse of the other. You noticed that, didn't you? Two straight nights of America. Happy birthday to her.